I want to thank the Aspen Institute as well and Elliot Gerson for his leadership uh, and so many others who have helped put this uh, event together today. As Shelley mentioned, you know, I just started this position uh, a, a few weeks ago, and it is a great honor and a great privilege th to have the opportunity to serve uh, the American people, but also to play a role in helping to make our country healthier and stronger. I want to tell you just a, a little bit about why I'm here in a larger sense. Uh, my journey to, to this uh, place began actually with my family many years ago. My parents traveled to this country from India. They left India in the 1970s. They came here for the same reason that so many other immigrants do, because they were looking for opportunity and for education for their kids, for my sister and I. And my father is a doctor. He's a primary care doctor. My mother doesn't have a MD or a DO behind her name, but she was every part, every much a part of creating and building the clinic uh, that my father saw patients in when we were growing up. And not knowing many people in Miami, uh, which is where we settled, and not having uh, much in the way of money and resources when we first arrived, we really set the, the, the clinic up as a, as a family practice, a family business, if you would. Uh, so my sister and I would spend time there on the weekends, uh, you know, sorting mail, cleaning, greeting patients from time to time, uh, being receptionist when the receptionist couldn't make it. Uh, and it was a great experience. But one of the things that I learned along the way, which I didn't expect to learn, was I learned that in order to contribute to somebody's healing, in order to create a healthier person, you have to do more than write prescriptions and run tests. But you have to understand who they are. You have to build relationships with them. You have to go to where they are, both uh, metaphorically and physically, to understand the environments in which they grew up. And that enables you to focus on prevention. It allows you to tailor your interventions uh, to suit their needs. And that's what my parents taught me. And that's what inspired me to go into medicine in the first place. But there was another part of my story growing up which is relevant uh, to all what you are all talking about here, and that was my experience with sports. You know, as a child, I was, I was a skinny kid who didn't have a lot of confidence. Uh, I had bad posture. I was told that again and again uh, by my parents. Uh, and, you know, I just I didn't hang out with a lot of friends, you know, because, uh, you know, I, didn't have, I just wasn't, didn't have a lot of confidence. I had low self-esteem. And one of the things that helped me become stronger, both physically uh, and emotionally, uh, was getting involved with sports. Uh, I played tennis uh, when I was a kid. <clears throat> I also, uh, you know, played football all the time uh, in my yard and with any teams that I could find. Uh, in school, uh, in elementary school, I was initially exposed to sports and that helped me to get a taste of what they were like and to explore them more. When I was in middle school, I got a taste for basketball uh, and for volleyball. And, you know, a lot of this came through, the, uh, these opportunities came through school. And if it had not been for the public schools that I went to in Miami, Florida, and the opportunities and exposure that they provided me, I don't know if I would have played uh, many of those sports. But through playing sports, I had a chance to not only build up my physical strength, but I had a chance to meet other kids, uh, to make friends, uh, to become more confident. It's hard to measure <clears throat> the impact of that when you're thinking about health outcomes. It's easier to measure blood pressure. It's easier to measure how many calories I consumed and burned. But the value uh, that sports played in my life uh, is, uh, for me, is unquestionable. Uh, and I want that experience, that kind of opportunity available, not only to my kids in the future, but to every kid uh, in America. So that's particularly why I'm so grateful uh, for the work that you are doing here today. And as I was talking <clears throat> you know, with, with some of your leaders earlier today, sports sometimes can be viewed as a privilege or as a luxury. Uh, but for me and for many uh, children uh, you know, who grow up in America, sports isn't just that, but it's a necessity. It can be a key to better health. Uh, it can be a source uh, of a foundation uh, or a component of a foundation that can help lead to better scholastic achievement and lead to more success later in life. And that's why what we have to do is to take sports out of the pure entertainment category and bring it into the health category. Uh, and that's part of the mission that I know all of you are very committed to. And it could not be a more timely mission because we face a situation now where nearly one in three children are either overweight or obese. Uh, we only have one in three kids who meet criteria for, physical for being physically active. And we also have a situation where only one in five homes uh, are located within half a mile uh, of either a park uh, or a physical fitness facility. And that's just not enough. So overcoming these barriers, figuring out how we can make sports more accessible uh, to every child, 
and is, is, is something that I know all of you are committed to, but it's something that I also want to focus on during my time uh, as Surgeon General. Overcoming barriers in general is a big part of the reason why I took this job. Uh, you know, during these next few years, one of my goals is to make sure that we are modernizing how we communicate from the Office of the Surgeon General. That means ensuring that the information that we put out is accessible not just to the few, but to the many. many to the many people who consume information through different media, uh, who consume information uh, sometimes not through media at all, but through friends and through, uh, through social channels. <clears throat> we need to make sure that we are getting information to everyone uh, so that the benefits of our science, the benefits of our knowledge uh, are available and open to all. But the second goal, in addition to modernizing communication, for me is to work closely with communities to translate that information into action. And that is arguably the harder step, but the more important one. Uh, it's the one where groups like all of you uh, are so important uh, into catalyzing that transition. <clears throat> but to really train, translate information to action requires two things. It requires changing structure, and it also requires changing culture. By changing structure, we allow uh, greater access to opportunities to engage in sports and physical activity. But even if there are no structural barriers, what makes the difference uh, between whether somebody actually engages in physical activity or not. The way somebody at work once put it to me is they said, if I come up to you with an apple in one hand and a cookie in the other hand, such that you have no structural barrier to accessing either one, they're equidistant from your hands, what makes the difference between whether you choose the apple or the cookie? That often has to do with social norms, what you are used to, what your friends and family eat. These are all elements uh, of culture and society which we also have to change while we're working on the reducing the structural barriers uh, to physical activity. And this is part of what we need to focus on <clears throat> uh, over in terms of our healthcare strategy over these coming months and years. Now, at last night, I had the uh, opportunity to, uh, to do some late night reading. I was going through the project play plan uh, that, that you've all put out. And I must say that it was, it was fascinating to me. Uh, it, it brought together so many wonderful ideas, ideas that people talk about that make sense, but need to be brought together in one place, uh, and that's what you've done with this report. I was uh, sharing earlier uh, this morning that I was actually reading at 1 o'clock in the morning, and my fiancé was sitting next to me, and she was working it well, and she, as well, and she said, what are you reading? You know, with this, because I was really intent on this report, and I said, you have to read this report. It's actually very exciting. So I, I'm excited about the roadmap that you have laid out <clears throat> in this report. I know that it took uh, a number of meetings, uh, a number of discussions, and a few years uh, to come to this point. But I think that what you've built is a very powerful roadmap. And the challenge now is how to take this roadmap uh, literally on the road uh, and translate it into something that is impacting communities uh, in terms of the engagement of kids and in terms of healthcare outcomes. Over these last, uh, speaking of hitting the road, over these last few weeks, I have actually been on the road a lot uh, as part of a Surgeon General's house call listening tour that we are doing around the country. And part of the intent of this uh, listening tour is to give me an opportunity to understand firsthand the challenges that are facing uh, our, our, our cities and our towns. It's also giving me an opportunity to learn about the lessons that people have gleaned through their experiences trying to address uh, some of these challenges. And I wanted to share with you just a few uh, of the, the larger lessons that have come uh, from this listening tour. In fact, I want to share with you three uh, specific emerging areas of success that communities are finding. One of these is to bring health to where people are. The idea that people need to come to hospitals or clinics alone uh, to engage with the healthcare system, to engage with prevention, uh, is an idea of the past. But we increasingly need to, to make sure that we are bringing health to communities, to neighborhoods, to people's homes. And the community health worker models uh, that I saw across the country, the mobile vans uh, that are helping provide preventive care and education to kids in schools, uh, these are very powerful models and ones that, uh, that hold promise. The second category were interventions that focus on interve intervening earlier and earlier in the life cycle. So interventions that focus on children, but also that focused on moms in the prenatal phase to make sure that mothers were getting what they needed to get their kids a healthy start from, the, from day one of life. And as it turns out, there were many wonderful examples here. I remember one that I heard in Roanoke, Virginia, a program called Healthy Chefs, which is in fact taking uh, kids in schools and helping them to learn about fruits and vegetables. And they're doing this not just by showing them pictures.
They're actually bringing the fruits and vegetables to the school. They're allowing kids to hold and touch them, to taste them, and then also to work with them in preparing uh, foods. And they found that all of these components are actually important to changing uh, what kids uh, actually do. And at the beginning of their program, they're at, they asked kids, what are your favorite foods? And they found that the big three were often part of that list. And I'm guessing you can probably all guess what the big three are. But they included pizza, hot dogs, and macaroni and cheese. Right? Which, you know, I think many people in this room would agree are pretty tasty. <laughs> But that said, uh, they're not always uh, <clears throat> the healthiest thing to be, you know, the, you know the, the staple of your diet. And so they also assessed what kids' uh, favorite foods were at the end of their intervention. And they found that the list had changed. The big three hadn't disappeared altogether. But in many cases, they had been replaced uh, by some of the fruits and the vegetables and the dishes that kids had tried during that time, uh, you know, in, in the program. And then they found one other thing which they didn't expect, which is that kids would then go home and teach their parents about what they learned. And they would ask for that dish. And then the parents would come back to the school program and say, hey, can you teach us how to make this? Because we don't know how to do it. And they had specifically designed this program uh, to have ingredients that were readily accessible and affordable in the community. There are analogs that you can think about when it comes to physical activity as well, about how we can engage kids, about how we can use the opportunity of uh, engaging children to also help bring parents uh, into uh, a more active lifestyle, which is something that we definitely need to do. But the last category that I want to share that I heard about was the importance of cross-sector collaborations. These were the initiatives that realized that just because you don't have the word health in your name as an organization doesn't mean that you don't have a big impact on health. These are the organizations that sought to create collaborations between uh, the Department of Housing, between urban development, commerce, uh, the criminal justice system, to build the kind of coalitions that would ultimately contribute to health, realizing that when kids and adults are healthier, then the benefits are actually spread across all sectors of government and society. So these cross-sector <clears throat> um, partnerships in particular are especially important, I believe, when it comes to increasing physical activity among kids. Because as all of you know so well, uh, this is not a healthcare problem alone, but this is a problem that requires a participation and the leadership of all sectors if we really want uh, kids to be more active, ultimately more healthy, and more successful in life. The last piece I want to share about uh, with you, though, from this listening tour, was that everywhere I went, I realized that people were hungry for collaboration and learning. When I went to Birmingham, Alabama, people would say, well, what are they doing in Orlando to fight obesity? Because we know it's a problem there, too. When I was in Ohio, uh, a state that uh, is struggling with high rates of infant mortality, particularly in the African-American community, they wanted to know what other states were doing that were more successful because they wanted to learn from them as well. So this hunger to learn from other communities, this hunger to collaborate across sectors, was something that I found everywhere I went. And that's actually why I believe that the work that you are doing in Project Play is so important because the ideas the support that you can provide, the network that you can help to pr provide to communities across the country is essential and it's much needed because that's what I heard time and time again uh, everywhere I traveled. <clears throat> you know, as we look at the, the road ahead uh, for the country, whether it comes to physical activity alone or more uh, broadly with regard to health, uh, we have a lot of challenges uh, that, that are ahead of us. <clears throat> Some of the challenges that worry me most are the challenges we face with obesity and with chronic disease. Uh, these category of illnesses are costing us dearly in terms of lives lost, disability caused, and dollars spent. And unfortunately, we are increasingly seeing that the face of chronic disease uh, is not just the face of older Americans, but it's increasingly the face of younger Americans as well. I remember uh, during my time uh, as an internal medicine doctor at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, <clears throat> I remember taking care of a, a young woman, probably in her 20s, uh, who came to see me because, uh, in the hospital because of a skin infection on her leg. And unfortunately, this was not the first time that she had had a skin infection, uh, also known as the cellulitis. Uh, she had developed the first one a number of years ago, uh, and she struggled with obesity, uh, later developed diabetes uh, at a very young age. Uh, and as you know, people with diabetes can, are, are more prone to developing infections, and she developed initially what was, seemed like a pretty benign infection uh, on her leg and she was given antibiotics by mouth to take to, uh, to treat that infection. And they worked, and she was fine, until the next infection came. 
and then the next infection after that. And her doctors found that it was harder and harder to treat these skin infections. And so she ended up having to come to the hospital uh, to get intravenous antibiotics, uh, ultimately, for some of these skin infections. But then over time, she developed re drug antibiotic-resistant bacteria uh, that were the cause of some of these infections. And she, oh, the time I saw her, she had actually been so, she was so sick that she ended up in the intensive care unit with sepsis because the bacteria spread, spread to her bloodstream, and she nearly died. And fortunately, she pulled it out, but as I, she pulled through. But as I saw her each morning uh, on rounds, and as I looked at her leg, I saw the evidence of chronic infections and the scars uh, you know, that unfortunately she had on both sides of her body. But there were also scars that you could not see. And these are the scars from a lifetime uh, battling obesity and diabetes, uh, from dealing with depression uh, and not knowing if she was ever going to get better. These are the scars that were much harder to treat uh, in some ways, uh, but which were important to address as well. And I think about her often. I thought about her when I was meeting with senators during my confirmation process and thinking about the great health care challenges that we face. I think about her when I go out to communities and hear stories of how young kids and older adults are battling with obesity and chronic disease. But I often think, what could have helped her uh, earlier in life? What could have prevented these life-threatening infections? And there are a number of things that could have helped her, from better nutrition uh, to a more supportive environment, but one of the things that likely could have helped her as well would have been physical activity, the opportunity to engage and be a part of an active culture, uh, which may have helped her uh, prevent some of the conditions uh, that she later developed. And it's for people like her that I believe it's so important for us to think holistically uh, and across the system uh, to figure out how we can get kids more active, more healthy, eating better foods, and ultimately give them a better start uh, at life, a better shot at living uh, a healthier life. You know, there are many, many kids uh, and many, many adults like the patient uh, that I shared, just shared, whose story I just shared with you. Uh, and many of them are waiting for us to act. They're waiting for us to do something uh, that will give them a better shot. And when I think about this particular moment that we're in, I think this is a historic moment. Because we, while we are faced with great odds uh, and an explosion of chronic disease over these past a few decades. We also have unprecedented opportunity in the coalitions that are formed, in the technology that we have, in the learning that we have developed from interventions that have been tried by communities across the country, a number of which have actually worked. And the real question is, can we pull together? Can we apply this knowledge? Can we do it in a sustainable way so that we can create, reverse some of these trends with obesity and chronic disease and ultimately create uh, a stronger population? People often talk about the natural resources and how important they are for our country. We talk a lot about oil, about our oil reserves, about our other reserves. What we don't talk often enough about uh, is our people reserves. And I believe that the most important natural resource that we have in this country is our people. When our people are strong, then our country is strong. But if our people are, are, are ill, if our society is riddled with chronic disease, then we are weaker then we are weaker not only as individuals, but also as a nation. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to <clears throat> uh, spend some time with a friend from Seattle who shared with me that she had been in Washington several decades ago when Martin Luther King uh, held his famous march. And she described to me what it was like to be a part of that moment in history. She talked about what it was like to be there with thousands of other people who didn't know what was going to happen, they didn't know if they were going to be the victims of violence that day. They didn't know if their march would have any impact in the country. They didn't know if their struggle for civil rights would ultimately be successful. But they knew that that was a pivotal moment for the country, and they wanted to be a part of that moment. They wanted to be a part of tipping the scales toward the side of justice. And she was one of those people. And she told me what it was like to tell her kids and her family members now, years later, about being a part of that moment, how proud she felt, how excited she was, and in turn, how proud and excited they were. And that made me think of now, and it makes me think of all of us, which is when we look back in 10 or 20 years, we will look at this as a special moment for health for our nation. We will look at this as a moment where we faced extraordinary challenges, but we also had an extraordinary opportunities to come together 
and to overcome those challenges, opportunities that we've never had before. And the question is, what will we tell our kids? What will we tell our grandkids? I want to be able to tell them that at this moment, when there was a lot of cynicism and concern about where we would go, that there were a group of people who were willing to step up, who were willing to speak out, who were willing to build the coalitions and initiatives and the movement around health that ultimately turned our country around uh, to a place of greater health and greater strength. And I believe that that's the story all of you want to tell as well. I believe that that's why you're here, that that's why even though you could be doing so many other things in life, given your extraordinary talents and abilities, you chose to be a part of this initiative to give kids a shot at better health and at a better life. And that's why I'm so proud to, of the work that you are doing, but also so grateful to have the opportunity to be here with all of you. Because together I believe that we can create stronger people, that we can create a stronger country. I believe that that begins with our children. And I think the opportunities that you are working so hard to provide for our kids, uh, opportunities around not just physical activity and sports, but really around health around a better life, that those are exciting, extraordinary opportunities that couldn't be import more important than right now. So thank you so much for the great work that you are doing. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, and I look forward to working together with you uh, as we seek to make our country stronger and healthier in the years ahead. Thank you so much.